Okay, everybody, we are back. I just had to double check on the different channels that we had open to make sure everybody was joining and could see where we are with the live training for five ways to transform your portfolio. So now that we're back, we can step through this a bit and I'll keep up with the chat. Uh, if you are watching specifically on YouTube, uh, there is a live chat there and I'm watching and responding to different things during that live chat on that live chat. So uh, that's what I'm keeping up with there. Let me just adjust this down. I don't think I need these headphones. Uh, it will just drown out any sound that might be coming from my computer. So I uh, wanted to walk through it. Uh, yeah, let's go through some of the house roll rules that we have here and step through the training. Uh, it be pretty quick, but it also be pretty valuable. So it'll be some good things that you can get there. Make sure my phone is on silent and there's no other distractions. All right, well, we can get started. And this replay will be available as well, but I'll step through that and show you. So here we are. Um, right now, I'm going to switch to some slides that I have. And these are the slides that are there. I may need to adjust this so that it all fits. And you all can see everything that I can see with this. All right, let me just make this adjustment so you all can see. All right, I believe you all can see exactly the same amount of uh, length of slides and everything that I can see as well. So that'll be good there. Make sure the slide fits. All right, good. Let's step through. So really quick, I just want to know where different people are from. Um, as I mentioned, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm based here in Houston, Texas, but I'm just interested to know where people are from. So whether you are watching live or you're watching on a replay, uh, I'll go back and watch it and look at those comments later. But I would definitely say, let me know where you're from because that does play an impact and that does play a role into uh, some of the things I'm going to say and some of the items that I'm mentioning might be easier than others. But ultimately, as long as you have access to the internet, Everything that I'm saying should be possible for you and you should be able to work with it and move forward with a lot of the recommendations that I'm talking about. So yeah, so where are you from? I'm just curious. As I mentioned, I'm based here in Houston, Texas in the United States of America. So right now it's a little after 1 p.m. and we're actually enjoying a holiday here in the United States and Memorial Day specifically. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> I see some people are leaving some comments. Uh, wow, okay, we got some people. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so no matter where you are, uh, that is one thing I do love about the internet, that we have this interconnectivity. It doesn't matter where we are or what time it might be, we can all just stay connected and speak with one another with that. So yeah, as I mentioned, whether it's on the replay or now, I'm curious to know where you're from. It might impact what I say, but more than likely, you'll be okay either way. So really just wanted to introduce myself uh i see you we got some people watching live from kenya it's awesome haven't been to kenya yet but i actually plan to go to uh, the continent of africa this summer so that's an awesome thing uh, yeah and i'll be commentating on some of the comments as well as uh, walking through this as well but yeah as i mentioned my name is nathan nathan alote and i am a freelance web designer so uh, freelance web designer specifically meaning that uh, I'm not attached to a particular agency or anything of that nature and I've run my own business doing freelance web design for nine to ten years now yeah so that's a little about me but I'll tell you a little bit more about who I am so just to introduce myself I'll walk through some of these items um, I went to Baylor University uh, Baylor University in Waco, Texas. Originally, I went there because I wanted to do electrical and computer engineering. That was my thought. That was my goal. Um, really, I chose that because I liked creating things. I liked the idea of taking something that didn't exist and making it a reality. That's something that I enjoyed. So I did engineering and electrical computer engineering at Baylor University. And then when I graduated, it actually was a recession. A lot of people were not hiring and I ended up working at a place, HostGator, web hosting company. I didn't think I'd work there initially, but it was a great company, a lot of smart people there. This was my introduction into 
web hosting, websites, the internet, uh, graphic design, you know, web design. This is my introduction there. I saw that there was a massive amount of people wanting to get online and get on the web. So with that, I said, wow, well, I have a very technical background. Maybe I should learn a little bit more about uh, web design. I started looking more into that. Um, HostGator was bought out by a parent company and that parent company also purchased Bluehost so a lot of their technology started coming together and so I did some work with Bluehost as well um, as I mentioned uh, during this time I thought to myself okay I've been doing freelance web design here and there uh, maybe I should formalize this because I was doing it pretty much anytime I wasn't at work and it was at this time I decided well I probably need to start my own business because I've learned enough and I have some clients. So I formalized my business and called it In Focus Media. And one of the clients that I received is actually um, Envato. Envato is a very popular uh, graphic design and creative assets company. Uh, they have tons of tools, a pretty large company. They're based out of Australia. That was one of my clients. So I worked with them and helped them with the redesign. I redesigned their website and as a gift they said well thank you for helping us uh, we want to actually give you a gift which is lifetime access to all of our tutorials they had a tutorial website uh, which still exists today I'm actually gonna make sure and pull it up and I'll probably paste it in the chat just so you all can see it but uh, it still exists today I did not design the iteration that you see now but um, I did have a hand in the one that came prior to that so um, I did help with that redesign and they said hey you have access to all of our tutorials I was like, oh okay and I started learning that everything I learned about web design I didn't necessarily learn the right way since I was self-taught some things I did the proper way but many things I did not right so that was something that I definitely needed to uh, correct and that was something that I definitely wanted to uh, set up myself specifically for that so yeah going from there um, I definitely said I learned the technical side and actually learned more about web design, but I'm not sure anything about business. I wasn't 100% sure about it, so I decided to get my MBA from the University of Houston. And I went to work during the day and I got my MBA, Master's in Business Administration, at nighttime. So that was the busiest time of my life, but also at that time I learned a lot. And one of the things I learned was the value of branding. So I started my own personal brand, NathanLote.com. And then, you know, even to this day, uh, that brand has expanded. And I host the Freelance Jumpstart podcast where I talk about creativity and business and how they intersect with one another. I talk about that on a weekly basis. That is an audio podcast and a video um, show on YouTube. So yeah, just really quick, uh, Freelance Jumpstart TV, like I said, I still host that show till this day. Um, talk about tons of things, whether it be pricing with clients, how to present certain things when you're meeting with clients, how do you set your own pricing, how do you choose the right target marketing, how do you make sure you're seen as a professional, not an amateur. Talk about tons of things. So any questions that I get, I make sure to talk about that on uh, Freelance Jumpstart and I'll paste that as well in the chat just so that you have it as a reference. It's uh, freelancejumpstart.tv. That's another place that I host things on a weekly basis and you can find me. So yeah, let's dive in. That's the introduction of who I am, but let's dive in. And as we dive in, uh, one of the things I just wanna make pretty clear is let's try to focus during this time. So let's minimize any distractions that may exist. And we can do so by, you know, making sure that uh, we minimize any other windows. We close out or put our cell phones on silent. Of course, keep your phone near you. If you need to go or answer the phone call, that's perfectly fine. But if you really want to focus, uh, I'd say silence your phone, close out some other things. Try to get to a quiet place in your home. Uh, right now, I'm in my um, office space here at my home. So uh, just try to get to a a quiet place you can get to so we can focus whether you're watching on the replay or watching live you need to pause it if you're watching on the replay that's fine you can come back to this later on uh, even if you're watching live you need to get up get something get a drink you're hungry you need to leave or you're just busy with family and other things 
that's fine. Like I said, that's why we are recording, and the replay will be available. If you need to leave, that's perfectly fine, but I am here. Um, got a question really quick from Jordan. Hey, Jordan, good to see you here. Uh, you mentioned where can people submit questions for the podcast. Uh, there is a contact page on my website. I believe it's nathanlote.com slash contact. But um, you can leave things there. Uh, you can message me directly on Twitter. You can message me directly on Instagram. It really doesn't matter. Uh, a lot of times, I don't care how you get the question to me. I just make sure to check all those outlets, and then I answer the question that way. So uh, for the podcast, if you had any type of question for me, direct email, social media, doesn't matter. Get it to me, and I'll make sure to answer that question. So just wanted to speak to that. Yeah, but just moving forward, so uh, let's minimize any other distractions. Of course, you can have the chat open. That's why I just responded to Jordan's question. Uh, but besides that, training will last about an hour. I try to make it quick. I uh, don't want to you know, lean on this for too long. Uh, you know, and when things get over an hour, it tends to drag on. You kind of forget what you learned in the beginning, right? So I just want to make it about an hour. Uh, besides that, um, ask your questions in the chat. We just saw Jordan ask a question. You're free to ask a question as well. I'll juggle between presenting and looking at that and make sure to answer any questions. We will have a set Q&A time at the end. I will say that. But regardless, I don't mind pausing for a moment and clarifying on any questions that might be given. You know, definitely don't mind. And lastly, as I've already mentioned, the video replay is available. So if you miss something, you're taken care of. You're good. Okay. Well, yeah, just going from there, just want to take the time to say why today is important. So I'll share a little bit of my story, but I also want to talk about why this is important to you who may be watching rewatching why this is important. Not sure about you, but for me as a creative, I guess you could say I was underestimated or I was put in the wrong bucket. I didn't do a good job in the past of talking about my skills, my talents and the value and what it's worth. So people just threw me in any type of bucket because if you don't choose a box, then people will throw you in anything. So if you don't set up and say, this is the box, this is the bucket that I'm in, I'm a professional, I'm on this level, and you don't set that standard, people will assume where you fall. And just to show you an example, uh, this is a look at different target markets. And I've talked about this previously on different trainings and uh, you know even different courses that I've done, but I just bring this back up because it's really personal to me. I found that people threw me in different places. So as it pertains to pricing and what people paid me, I noticed there's these categories. Give me a hookup, people who want a deal or a discount, people who are opportunistic, you can persuade them either way, um, whether it's a low or high price, you can kind of talk them into paying you more money, but you're gonna have to convince them. And then lastly, luxury and premium, where people don't mind paying more um, and they have a higher willingness to pay as long as it's about quality. So they say, if it's high quality, I don't care what the price is. Now for me, I thought I'd be somewhere in the middle, but where people were throwing me was the bottom left-hand corner. They were throwing me in the, give me a hookup or deal. Um, that's where they were throwing me. They were throwing me in that category and I wasn't happy about it. Um, you know, people always came to me wanting a discount from my web design services, or they would say, I see this website, can you make it look like this for a super low price? So that entire process took a long while for me to reposition myself as a professional and it took some time and I made some mistakes along the way and I want to give you an example and show you what triggered how I need to be a professional. So I created a website for a client. Now this website looked pretty good and I was proud of it and I didn't charge them that much money. I charged them about a thousand dollars. Now this is in the past. So during that time, I actually was curious and like, you know, what are my websites worth? So I contacted a couple of different agencies and even other freelancers. They weren't in Texas. They were elsewhere. 
Uh, well, I take that back. Only one of them was in Texas. The rest were not in the same audience or target market that I had. So I contacted them and showed them my website. I did not tell them that I created it. And I asked them, how much would you charge for this website? So I mentioned I charged a thousand dollars for it. Uh, the first place I went to was a design studio and they said, well, you know, for something like this, we would charge you about, you know, 5,000. I'm like, okay. So I somewhat saw that, okay, my web design has a little bit more value that I'm giving myself credit for. That's something to think about. Okay. Um, I, I thanked them and I moved on. And then I found an agency that did similar work to me and I contacted them and said, how much would you charge for a website like this? And it's one that I created. They said $10,000. So it was at this moment I realized, wow, I am severely undercharging for my skills and my services because, you know, in the past I thought I made $1,000 when really, no, I missed out on 9,000 extra dollars that I could have had and it matched the output level of an agency. So when I learned this, this had me a bit curious to say, wow, um, what's the difference between them and me? You know, what's going on? So in a sense, um, I went undercover, right? I started talking to many different agencies, asking different questions. I even um, was a client for some of the agencies. I said, hey, I'm a potential client. I have some questions. I asked them tons of questions. I even went as far as to study how this went on. I mentioned I was doing freelance web design. And I said, you know, actually, I'm going to get a job. I am going to get a job. And uh, when I get this job, I am going to see how agencies work with us. So I just started working at a company. And when I started working at a company, I learned, okay, well, if nothing else, I learned what they expected out of agencies. I learned what they expected out of agencies. And we worked with quite a few agencies. And I just started paying attention to what they were doing, how they were doing it, how they I asked them different questions. Hey, do you work with freelancers? So they were giving presentations and and all this time I was learning and studying what it is that they were doing. Because so I was thinking to myself, I work for this company at the moment, but I'm going to study how this agency works because I want to apply it to my own business. So I really started seeing the difference between myself and them, and which posed a question. What's the difference between a freelancer, a consultant, and an agency? Because that's what I saw when I was observing what was going on. I saw that the agency existed and they tended to get larger pricing, uh, larger contracts. I also saw that you know we brought in consultants to do certain work. And from what I learned, you know their hourly rate was literally, wow. Um, 20 times my own hourly rate, right? Uh, hi, I, saw, I see somebody else tuning in from Kenya. How's it going? So I saw that they were charging sometimes 20 times what I was getting. And I was like, wow, not only am I severely underpriced, but there's something that these consultants and agencies are doing that I am not doing. So as I began to study them more, I learned that they had a creative process. I'm still undercover, which is why there's this James Bond theme here on the slide. But I started seeing that they actually had a creative process. And I'll walk you through what that process is through my observation. That process is they had planning and strategy. They sat down with the client and planned out strategically what they wanted to do strategically meaning that the company has an overall mission and goal that they want to accomplish and we need to talk about how they're going to execute uh, whatever type of marketing it is uh, whatever type of design or graphic campaign it is we need to talk about regardless of what campaign it is this is how it strategically aligns with the mission of your company so they plan things out then they move to creation and development they get to a point where they say okay now we are going to create many different things and we're going to develop many different things based on the strategy we laid out. Then we're going to execute on these things. Uh, we're going to launch some campaigns. We're going to put some videos out. We're going to um, do some social media, but then we're going to analyze it. We're going to see 
Is this doing what we want it to do? That's another thing that they had. That was a creative process. And let me go into a little bit more detail about each. When I say planning and strategy, uh, they work with a client to understand their business, uh, their goals and their customers, right? And with this, they do certain things like a discovery session. Uh, they do research, user experience. They look at their positioning, their branding. Uh, they look at those things. That was a part of the planning step. When it comes to creation and development, this is just the creation of creative assets. It doesn't matter if it's user interface, um, if it's web design, web development, graphic design, whatever it might be for print, packaging, if it's writing, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, that's the creation and development phase. Then after that phase, you get to execution and production. So everything that was created, it doesn't matter if it's a video or anything else, how are you going to get it out there and choose the right target audience that aligns with the business, right? That's another thing. So I saw that and I was like, okay, execution production. Then last, it was analyzing and optimizing. So a lot of times they'd have um, a meeting, post campaign or something of that nature and they're asking the question, did what we do really work? And if it did, where did it work? What needs to be fixed? What needs to be improved upon? And then we can start this cycle all over again. So we're analyzing and optimizing, but it, it goes back to the strategy and we're looking at this aligns with the strategy and then we start creating different things or iterating on what's already been created and it moves forward in that nature. It's not even just talking to the client itself. It might be other things like surveys from other people who were the client's customer and asking them to say, was this marketing effective for you? Or was this, how did how'd you interact with this thing that was created from this company? That was the creative process. And when I noticed it, this is the entire creative process laid out. Uh, and I also have a video on this where I go into even more detail. So if you're wondering about that, uh, I'll have that video. I'll put it in the show notes, I'll find it. Um, there's a particular video where I go into all the details about this. So if you're wondering and thinking, uh, this is decent, this is a lot of things on a slide, um, you don't necessarily have to worry because like I said, there's an entire video where I go over this. So that's why freelancejumpstart.tv is a great place to go because I talk about things like this on a weekly basis. But I just wanna quickly summarize it for you here. So all these things are the creative process. But I noticed something. Consultants live on the left-hand side. Consultants, in a sense, help with the planning and strategy. Um, they, tr they try to, in a sense, help the client know that they're making a right decision. And a lot of times, consultants have been there, done that, they have experience with that. So they try to educate the client, let them know, if you wanna make this decision, this is what you need to do. A consultant may also analyze something that's already been done and then give a recommendation for planning and strategy, right? A lot of times they're not creating anything. They're not working on production. They're just coming alongside somebody, helping them make the best decision based on their budget, based on their goals, whatever it might be. I also think that freelancers tend to live on the right-hand side of this four quadrants. That's where freelancers live. Now, freelancers are more so creating certain things and then executing. So maybe you are a graphic designer. So you're creating uh, different flyers. You might be creating different graphical elements for a social media campaign, or maybe you're creating them for the campaign and you're actually deploying them on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You're putting things out there. So you're creating content and then you're actually putting it up. Sometimes you create it, pass it on to their internal team. Sometimes you're doing both. And I also noticed Agencies fall somewhere too. So I asked a question earlier and I'll go back to it. What's the difference between a freelancer, a consultant and an agency? And we looked at a consultant and a freelancer, but I also noticed an agency fell into every category. Agencies would do everything. Sometimes agencies use freelancers, right? To help with creation and development. But ultimately an agency had the planning down the creating down, they would execute your new production and launch and then analyze it and then come back to planning again. So an agency captured the full cycle and was able to completely work with the client 
as well as uh, more completely work with their budget, right? So they're coming along with the client, trying to work with them for the long run and help them on something, not just a one-off project. And I noticed as a freelancer, I was working on one-off projects. I get a client, I do something, they thank me, they kind of move on. They come to me saying, I want a website. They come to me saying, I want, I need help. I need a logo. I need this. They come to me asking for something, but I didn't know what their plan was. I wasn't sure how they got to the conclusion of they needed a website or they needed a logo. They just came to me and said, I need you to do work. Now in the past, I just said yes, but when I wanted to work with them and you know, Hey, I want income as well. But when I started realizing this creative process, I'm like, wow, I'm missing out and being seen as less valuable because they only think I can create. What about all that I've learned? What about everything I learned in business school and my MBA program and all the experience I have from clients? And I've learned a lot and I can be of more value than just creating things. But I wasn't acting like that. So I have a question um, today where do you fit on this chart? Do you call yourself today or based upon how I explained it? Are you a freelancer? Are you a consultant? Or are you acting as an agency? Maybe you're some hybrid of the two, the three, not 100% sure, but I am curious to know, what are you at the time in which I was looking at this and discovered this, I was a freelancer. I've pivoted more towards consultant agency and I'll tell you why. And that's also going to impact the portfolio as well. But yeah, that's just me. But I'm curious if you're, even if you're watching on the replay, I'm curious to know where do you fall? All right. Where do you fall? But I have a comment. If you are a freelancer and you call yourself, a freelancer do not do this even in as it pertains to your portfolio if you say um, hi you know my name is Michael I am a freelance web designer from France I am a freelance web designer from Austria I'm a freelance web designer from Seattle don't do that don't call yourself a freelancer now us here talking amongst one another as creative professionals as friends as associates we can call each other freelancers because it makes sense, but don't call yourself a freelancer because when you call yourself a freelancer, people tend to view that as you're more risky. They view that as, Oh, you're a freelancer. So you work by yourself or, Oh, you're a freelancer. Okay. You might not have as much experience as an agency. That's not true, but that's how some people perceive it because it's just you. So if you are calling yourself a freelancer, don't do that. And I did call myself a freelancer earlier on purpose. I said I was a freelance web designer. No, I don't call myself that as of today. I call myself a digital marketing strategist when I'm working with or talking with clients. I say I'm a digital marketing strategist and then they say, oh, well, what does that mean? Or what do you do? And it gives me an opportunity to tell them more about what it is that I do. When I said I'm a freelance web designer, they automatically attach web designer. They already attach a random meaning to it, or they attach their previous experience with any other designer to my title. That doesn't need to be the case. You know, um, it needs to really be you're controlling the perception of how someone knows you as a professional, right? Something to think about. I have tons of content on that. Um, again, I will paste that in different places so that you can see it. Um, even anything I mentioned in this live training, I'll summarize it and you'll be able to see that. But I have tons of things that point to what I believe to be great resources as it pertains to whether you call yourself a professional, this, that, or the other, or you call yourself a freelancer, um, how that looks, how to even come up with your job title. I have all this content. And I'll share it with you. So I make, I'm making mention of it now, but I'll come back to it and why it's important later, right? Okay, so just getting back to things. The reason why it doesn't matter 
whether you are a freelancer or you work at an agency because it's about your skill. So name choosing a name for yourself is one thing to help people try to focus that you actually have value and skill. But as uh, Chris Dove puts it, and he is he actually owns an agency and he teaches some things online. Uh, he's a designer himself. He says, agencies sell the talent of their designers. Now, someone may see this and say, well, obviously, but it's really a little bit more deeper than that. It's an agency doesn't have something that you as an individual don't have. What I mean by that is, yes, they might have more people. They might have an infrastructure. They might have their own building or they might have different associates in different places. But at the end of the day, all they're doing is selling talent. And if all the designers went on strike at that agency or left that agency, what are they? So you as a designer, you as a creator, you have talent. The important thing is you need to know how to communicate that talent accurately so that people can look at it and see that you are good enough to place trust in, to place finances in, to get the job done. So you, so it's not about just having talent. It's communicating that your talent can produce value. That is the crucial thing. And I would say if you get nothing else from this, uh, the quote of what I just said is important. You have talent. Yes. You have skill. Yet, Even if you don't, you can learn, you can grow, you can figure it out. That's perfectly fine. So even if you don't have it, you can gain it. But at the end of the day, you need to know that your skills are important, your talent is important, but you have to learn how to communicate that. Now, I'll admit that can be difficult because you may feel like you're bragging. Uh, you may feel like, mm, you know, I don't want to try to talk about myself and try to convince people. You may feel like that, but ultimately, uh, no, you actually need to do that. And you need to communicate it in that way. You need to talk about how things are going with you as a professional. You need to say, yes, I've learned these amount of things. I can get the job done. So in other words, you need to learn how to sell yourself. Now I'll pause here for a moment because I think Jordan had a question more so she's thinking out loud. She's just talking about, she needs to figure out what to call herself. So she's wondering about that and wondering what to call herself. So here's a quick thing, Jordan, you can bookmark or go to later. Um, it's a video called Why Your Job Title Matters. And it's actually a candid conversation I have with a filmmaker named Corey McCabe. Jordan, I believe you know Corey because we've all met each other in person. Um, and we're just talking about how to come up with your name or what to call yourself and why it matters. And we walk through that. It's a candid conversation, it's a good conversation, but I think if you watch that, you'd be able to figure out what to call yourself. All right, it's a quick sidebar. So let's get back to it. So this is important. We need to be able to communicate and show our talent as professionals and people need to be able to look at it and get it. So now we're getting to the five ways to transform your portfolio because it's about communicating our value. So the first thing is you need to copy other agencies. There are tons, if not thousands of agencies just in the country that I live in. When we make it worldwide, there's tens of thousands of tons of agencies out there, tons of other creatives out there. And there are some that are more popular than others. Um, some people may not be familiar with, you know, agencies. Well, what are they called? Where are they? They're in the creative world. There are certain agencies that are top tier, if you will. But besides that, I would say just copy how they've laid out their portfolio. I don't mean copy as in steal their work specifically. I mean, copy as in imitate how they're laying things out. Now, uh, here are, is an example of four agencies that exist that I like. One is called Landor. They're a very popular agency. Another one is called Blind. I quoted their founder, Chris Doe, earlier. It's out of LA. I've actually been to Blind. I visited there uh, multiple times. I've talked to their staff. 
they like working with freelancers too. But I like how Blind does things, right? Uh, there is one that's local to me in the city of Houston, Texas. It's called the Black Sheep Agency. So that's what I would even say. Uh, with what I'm mentioning to you now, I'd probably say start local. But I'll come back to this. And then there's one called Pentagram. Pentagram is very popular. They've had clients like NBC and a lot of networking and broadcasting channels. They're very popular. They're very well known. Uh, Pentagram does a lot of good work. And so these are some of the popular agencies. So if you're watching, I would say, think about it from this perspective. Write down at least five agencies that you like. And if you don't know um, five agencies, then you can start looking for them online. But five agencies that you like, that's what I'd say. Write, you know, make it a point to write that down. Now, one agency that I like, as I mentioned, is Blind. Their website is blind.com. <laughs> Great domain name, but blind.com. And I like how they lay things out and how they do things. So as I mentioned earlier, you want to copy, you want to mimic, you want to borrow, and you want to emulate and or steal their ideas. Their ideas of how they're laying things out. I don't mean copy their work, because trying to present something like you did it is absolutely wrong. But I'll come back to that. So here's a question. Um, which one is the agency and which one is me? If you really can know or if you can guess, that'd be great. Technically, we have different logos on them, but at first glance, you might not be able to tell. So the point is, you know, and somebody mentioned Black Sheep Agency, great. We probably need to meet up. Black Sheep does do a lot of meetups. But coming back to this one specifically, all I did was emulate how they've laid things out. And what you're looking at, is, my work is on the right-hand side. Uh, theirs is on the left-hand side. I emulated how they laid things out in their proposals. Now, the cool thing about this is when I did this, I immediately received more respect from potential clients. So uh, this is really what I did. I changed my entire proposal process and emulated how they do proposals. So when someone said, hey, what is it like to work with you? Um, you know, how much do you charge? So on and so forth. I show them this is my price. It's a range based upon what you want to do. Somewhere between five and 20K. Now I mentioned earlier, I used to charge $1,000 for a website. So when I said it's somewhere between five and 20K. Now, even though some clients saw the range and was scared because they're like, whoa, five to 20 K, that's a big range. I don't know if I can work with you. Even though some people were nervous, no one in a sense disrespected me or gave me a perspective like, <laughs> yeah, $10,000, $20,000. Uh, he's not worth that. They just said, oh, wow. So they, they based it on how I laid things out and they just respectfully said, oh, I wish we can work for you. Hopefully we can work with you one day in the future. And that is all about um, why you could emulate an agency. And Jordan made a quick comment. She said, I thought yours was on the right because you know I kind of already familiar with like your brand and your style. So good job on that, Jordan. But yes, so any agency that you see any of their portfolio, any of their work, you can emulate what it is that they're doing and come across as more professional, right? Um, not only that, but the reason why this is important and another reason why I'm emulating their portfolio and how they lay things out is if you actually want to work with an agency, uh, I mentioned earlier and I quoted Chris Doe, agencies to sell the talent of their designers. So if you can convince an agency that you as a freelancer or you as a creative produce work that looks similar to things that they already create and is on the same level as the things that they already create, then they may be more inclined to work with you because they see, oh, well, this person already gets it. So they fit right in with our company and with our culture. So somebody brought up uh, Black Sheep. Uh, with the Black Sheep Agency, they're local here to Houston, Texas. I could say their portfolio, their layout, 
I could produce something similar, whether it's real or it was just a concept. I could produce something similar, put it in my portfolio, and then say, uh, Black Sheep Agency, my name is Nathan, Nathan Lote. I am a web designer. I do some graphic design as well. Uh, I will, you know, I have availability to work with you. I'm very responsive. I get back in a timely manner. Here is an example of a project that I did. Now, they don't know I studied them and came up with this portfolio piece, you know, to show them. But I can do that, send them that email. They can say, oh, wow, okay, we'll keep Nathan in mind or we may work with Nathan because he produces work on a similar level to us, right? And that's all from just studying or copying what other agencies are doing. So that's the first quick tip, something very simple. You can do that. It may take time to study and learn, but ultimately, uh, if you imitated someone, you would be that much more better than what you used to have. At least that's what it was for me. The second tip is to show your process and really just to capture um, honestly what I mean by this, uh, there is a quote from Ben Burns. He also works at Blind, that same agency that I studied. And he says this, the product you sell is not what you create. It's how you create. It's your process. So the thing that I enjoy about this quote is he's talking about what makes you unique. Anybody can honestly do graphic design. When I mean anybody, I know it takes a certain set of skill, but when I say anybody, I mean with the internet where it is nowadays and all the free learning as well as paid learning that exists and online courses that exist, people can take classes and learn how to make things using this graphic design software. They can do it. It may take them a lot of time, but they can do it. So we can't focus on the fact that I'm a good graphic designer. I'm a good web designer. I'm a great writer. We can't focus on our skill because we place too much emphasis on our skill. Then when someone else is more skilled than us, we're not chosen, right? Or if somebody's faster than us or cheaper than us and produces similar work, then we're not going to get chosen. So we need to focus on our process and the fact that our process produces results, right? And we say, I have a unique process. I go about it in this manner. And when I go about it in this manner, it produces results. Look at all these uh, satisfied clients, these clients that have given testimony. I put them through the process. So if I take you through the process, you'll have results too, right? So that's the mentality that we want to have. Just on that note, um, I'll paste something else in the chat. I created a video called The Professional and the Pin. And that, in a sense, really alludes to what I'm talking about. And I expand upon that. So uh, here's a question really quick. Um, yeah, Jordan saying she's not a designer specifically, but she likes helping designers figure out how to tell the story of their process through case studies. And uh, Jordan picked, an, I think, an awesome specialty, which is case studies. People don't like bragging about themselves, so it's very hard for them to figure out how to describe the value they produce or the value they produce for someone else. And again, that speaks to the quote that we're looking at, which is, we really need to refine and talk about our process more than we talk about our skills. The mistake I made in the past is I create something nice and it looks beautiful. And I just put it in my portfolio and thought pictures are enough. They're not enough. I have to describe the process. A good uh, illustration of this is something I got from Samuel Hulick. Uh, he is a user interface consultant uh, very good user experience consultant more specifically because he talks he walks through different um, user experiences for different tech companies and he comments on okay these are things that you need to fix the user might have to you know work on this he does user journeys and things of that nature and I've interviewed him for freelance jumpstart and we had a great conversation uh, he actually created this graphic for a book he did but I just like how it gets to the point this is Super Mario if you don't know who Super Mario is uh, I don't know, maybe your childhood was focused on studying, but Super Mario video game character, the video game character that kind of started all of this. But anyway, um, he says, look, here's Mario, and here is a power-up fire flower. 
what people tend to talk about is how awesome they are. They say, um, I'm a graphic designer. I have this many years of experience. These are all the clients that I've worked with. Look at me. I worked with Google. Look at me. I've worked with Apple. Look at me. I can help you. I produce results. Look at me. I'm so fast. You're talking about yourself too much. And you can't just talk about your client because say, hey, you need to work with me because look how you are right now. I know you don't like the results that you're getting. Um, if you work with me, you'd be better. If you don't, then it's not going to work. Now you're focusing too much on like the client doesn't have anything to offer. But when you combine these two and talk about how awesome the person could be when they've worked with you, that is what you want to focus on. So focus on this stage to the far right, that they're awesome, but only after your help and just describe what it's like after they've worked with you. So in a sense, if you can really capture how things are when they've worked with you and just describe that in your language, in your conversation, then now you're getting into, this is how awesome it is, or this is how awesome you could be when we work together, but my product is my process and we need to talk about my process. If you don't have a process, you don't have a creative process, you never, you know, you don't know how to describe one, you don't know um, what's best about it or different things of that nature, then I would personally say, use the one that I have here. I mentioned planning and strategy earlier and creating and execution and optimization. If you don't want to offer all these things, you know, decide which quadrant you want to play in, right? Maybe you're a consultant, maybe you're just a freelancer, maybe you're saying, hey, I'm someone who just does strategy. I don't do anything else. I'm someone who creates. I don't do anything else. I'm someone who executes. I'm not going to do any type of graphic design. Just, you know, hand me the creative assets so and gave you, and I'll focus on social media marketing. I won't do any creating, but I will, you know, hit the nail on the head with social media marketing and analyzing. So you can choose a quadrant to work in. You don't have to work in all of them, not by any means. But uh, if you choose to, uh, you know, definitely make sure that you choose one of these things. But ultimately, if you don't have a process, everything that I've listed here on this slide is the creative process in a sense. And here's a better description of that. I'm putting this in the chat as well. It's another video of the whole creative process. So if you want to go deeper on that, I will put that in the chat and I just posted it and you can watch that too. All right. So this is the creative process. So what does that look like in your portfolio? You need to just start explaining your design thinking. A lot of times I would, this is my fault. I'd get a client, I'd go away in my secret lab, I'd work on something and then I'd come back and say, you know, voila, look, look at what I created. Um, isn't it amazing? but I wouldn't tell them how I came about it and what it all means. So in other words, I wouldn't describe my decisions. And this is something that Jordan probably knows about in the chat. When it comes to case studies, a good note is you need to describe why you made certain decisions and why those decisions have value, right? That's an important thing. So here, um, I actually saw this on Behance. It was from a designer. I thought it was a good example. Pretty much, they chose a certain layout of a concept logo, but they're explaining where it came from. They're saying, okay, um, you know, there's some type of overlapping of things or grouping of things. And, you know, this is a hanger. But I noticed in this hanger, there's somewhat of these brackets, right? So if we combine a hanger with grouping things together, you know, we get a symbol. And so when we're talking about style, this looks like, you know, a certain part of a hanger, but it's also grouping this thing together. Now, visually, they showed how they got to where they were. Makes sense. You know, uh, hey, how's it going? I see you from Portugal. How's it going? <laughs> how are you? But no, um, honestly, they're describing visually how they got to where they are. Another example, um, I like this. This is Jungle Bean Coffee. Also found this from another designer. Um, this is a coffee cup. This is a leaf. Put the two together. The leaf is on the coffee cup at somewhat of a 
uh, three-fourths aerial view from it. And this is the logo, Jungle Bean Coffee. It, it's a little minimal because you can still somewhat see the outline of the cup. So they took away detail, but you see a leaf, cup, coffee. Got it. And they showed how they got there. This is a lot more powerful than just putting something up like the logo by itself and you don't know what it means or how someone got there, right? Um, so on this point, I honestly was not planning to post all of um, these videos and things that I'm talking about. I wasn't, but anytime I say something, I'm like, wow, I've already done a video on that where I go deeper on that. So um, I actually do have a video where I talk about this specifically. It's called Speak Up For Your Work. And um, I'm finding that, I'll post that in the chat too. So there's a lot of value on these videos here. Yeah, so I'll post that in the chat. You can bookmark it, look, watch that later. But ultimately, again, you need to speak up for your work. And if you can't verbally speak up for it, visually, you need to talk about it. And this is a great way to visually talk about your work. Um, it doesn't matter uh, even if you're a writer, right? Maybe you put certain words here and you say, I started with this type of reasoning. I started with this line of reasoning. Uh, I combined them and wrote about this. That works too. But this is just a simple way to illustrate in your portfolio visually, this is how I came to this conclusion, right? Uh, this even works with colors, right? Maybe you are doing branding or you're doing some graphic design work uh, or web design work and you're saying, I'm not 100% sure how I got to this color. Okay, maybe you combined green with light blue and it created navy blue. That's how you landed on that color. You can show that visually, this is how I got to this color. Nothing wrong with that, you can do that. So ultimately, show your process. Don't just put a picture of something up there that looks nice. It's not good enough. And if you're going to compete with different agencies, then you also need to show what that process is. Uh, Sister Audrey, how are you doing? I see you on here, how are you? So, you know, going from there, um, yeah, awesome. So you need to talk about your process. And not only that, you need to add visual storytelling. This does not matter if you are a writer, a designer, a photographer, videographer, it really doesn't matter. Maybe you are a hand lettering artist, great. Doesn't matter what you are. I'll pause and say this. What I am about to walk through is the most important thing I believe in this entire training. What I'm about to say in this section, I think is the most important thing. And in my opinion, very easy to do. I don't mean easy as in simple and doesn't take a long time. I mean easy in terms of if you learn to do what I'm talking about, the overall impact it will have is greater than a lot of the other things I'm talking about. Visual storytelling. So a good visual storytelling piece is something that you can look at and it just tells a story. I tend to tell people, oftentimes movie posters do this very well. A good movie poster someone can see, they can get an idea of what the story is, but it doesn't give away the ending. And it intrigues them to take action, right? That's a good movie poster. I've made a couple movie posters and yeah, I think it captured, it was very similar to the title. It captured the essence of the title for the movie posters that I made. So visual storytelling, like I said, it doesn't matter if you're a writer or elsewhere, you can combine it. I'll show you what I mean. This is how to use visual storytelling. So the first thing you will want to do is maybe you have a client and I'll use that as an example. Maybe you have a client who wants some type of branding marketing campaign for their coffee shop. It's a local coffee shop and it exists. Uh, the first thing that you need to do is search for it on Google or any other search engine that you would like. Search for it and go to images. So here on the coffee shop, I went to images. Let me actually move these out the way so you can see this. All right, so I searched for coffee shop 
Uh, it might be kind of small for you to see, so let me zoom in a bit. Okay. I just did a live search and took a screenshot of it, so that's perfectly fine. So I went to Coffee Shop. Well, excuse me. I went to Google and typed in Coffee Shop, and I see many pictures of Coffee Shops. What they look like, what's inside of them, what people are doing, right? Um, I'm looking at it. And then even at the top, they have other words here that are similar. These are important because in a sense, it's telling you what coffee shops have. Now, when you do this search, these are things to pay attention to. And let me step back. You want to create a keyword list. Let me move this out the way so you can see it. You want to create a keyword list. Where is this located? What do people do there? What feeling do you get? Emotion. Um, is it calm? Is it relaxing? Um, you know, what feelings are people getting? Uh, and then what items or things are usually there? These questions are somewhat answered on this page, right? Like, what do, what do they have there? Uh, it says here, bar. It says menu. It says vintage. Okay. How does, how, I said, how does it feel? Look, emotion, it says cozy. Pay attention to those things. All right. So these are the questions you want to answer. I actually made a keyword list for um, this, and I did a keyword list. These are some of the things that I observed in the images that I saw on Google. Let me move out the way so you can see it clearly. These are some of the things I saw on Google. It was oak, reclaimed wood, uh, reclaimed wood itself, coffee mug, uh, coffee beans. I saw some tabletops. I saw people on laptops. People were reading. They were studying. They were having a conversation. They were relaxing. Uh, it was a calming place. Uh, normally a lot of coffee shops were on the street corner. Um, lot, some of their signage outside was on a street corner and they had like a chalk sign outside. I saw a lot of hand lettering, espresso, AeroPress. These are different ways to make coffee, but I saw espresso, AeroPress, Chemex. A long time ago, I didn't even know what a Chemex was. So this is a cool thing to make coffee. Um, I saw leather many different leather pieces of furniture colors you want to write down some colors white black brown dark tan I saw a lot of that uh, you know modern was another thing see here's tan here's uh, black here's gray uh, black tan white clean I saw a lot of the same type of colors even though these are various pictures it has a lot of the same elements right and one word that I saw was barista I did see that uh, barista came up I didn't capture it here, but when I scrolled down and looked at other things, barista came up. So I highlighted barista because that's something I can add to a portfolio to enhance what I am talking about. So if I have a client who I have a coffee logo to create, I can create the logo. I called this out for a reason. So I'm going back to this slide where I found a designer who made jungle bean coffee. Now they can really call this out. So if this is their logo, they explained how they got there, but visually, if I were to see their portfolio, if they highlight these signals, I would already know it's a coffee shop. I don't even need to read anything. I don't need to see anything that they say. If I see um, a lot of wood, people on laptops, if I see coffee cups, some like hand lettering, and I start to see these colors, my brain automatically says, this is coffee shop. Now I'm, I don't have to explain or read anything. I just start to see that it's a coffee shop and they can enhance what it is that I'm seeing. But I chose barista as a word. Now you can go to unsplash.com. Unsplash.com is a community of people who have freely donated their images for use. So in other words, it's almost free stock photography. So I go to Unsplash, I've used this on my portfolio, I've used this for different clients before. I do give credit to the photographers who have taken those photos, but I don't have to pay anyone. But I've also 
uploaded images that I've taken and people have used them too. So I'm not just taking from them. I've uploaded images I've taken and people are benefiting from my stuff free as well. So it's a give take type relationship. You don't have to give, but I just felt like I should. So Unsplash is a place that I, I went to. I type in barista, right? And when I type in barista, I see all these images. All of these images are fair game for me to take and use in my portfolio to enhance it and make it better, right? Um, it's best to use imagery that doesn't have a logo in it, um, that matches up with who your client was. If your client was, um, if the target market of who they were trying to reach is like, you know, older people between the ages of 60 to 80, then I probably don't need to use these young people at a coffee shop. I might need to use an older man reading a newspaper, older woman reading a newspaper at home. Do people even still read newspapers? I don't know. But if it was an older audience that was my target, I probably would need to use that. But if my target was just a regular coffee shop and I'm looking for millennials or one of the most overused terms I've heard that people don't know how to describe, hipsters, then these type of images are perfect. So I would look through these images and I can grab any one of them. Now I can also alter these images. If I made a logo, and we talked about this logo earlier from this designer, Jungle Bee Coffee, maybe I need to put my logo here and slightly give it a Gaussian blur in Photoshop and make it a little blurry so my logo is here. Maybe I need to put my logo on her hat. I can do that. Maybe all these coffee cups here, I need to change it and put my logo there, right? Uh, maybe on this guy, I can put the logo here using Photoshop. It doesn't matter what it is that I do, or a picture like this is perfect. I, I don't have to put a logo on it at all, but I can highlight it. That's some visual storytelling. An example of someone or a company that does this well is called Farm Design. Uh, let me show you a piece that they did. They actually made this logo um, for Rust Espresso. They made this logo, and this is a 3D model of their logo. Let me move these out the way. Uh, they made this as a 3D model of the logo work they did. Now, if you look to the right, this is actually on their portfolio. If you look to the right, they have an image of kind of a hipster type coffee person. Uh, he's got an apron on, and he's making espresso question is this like really is this their client I don't know it kind of looks like it either way it sets the scene like wow like this they went to a coffee shop to take photos of their client wow they really care now the reveal here is farm design made up this logo this company doesn't exist <laughs> this company doesn't exist and they didn't have a client they literally just made this up in their portfolio as a way to draw in clients and they used visual storytelling all through their portfolio as an example of people glancing at something and saying, man, this is coffee. They help people visualize, wow, my brain can look like this. And yeah, I do want a coffee shop that looks like this. This they're perfect to work with. So again, visual storytelling, I'm, I'm just quickly reviewing because I feel like this is important. Based on your client, what is the main thing that they do? Search on Google, go to images, write down certain things that you see on those images. Where is it located? What do they do? How do you feel? What items are there? Make a keyword list and you know, start searching these keywords in a, on a place like Unsplash so you can find those images and add those to your portfolio. As I said, feel free to give those photographers credit, but use it to enhance the photo, what would happen if Jungle Bean Coffee, instead of this here to the left, it was a picture of a barista? Kind of does the same thing. You get why you get it, right? That's important in visual storytelling. So I stayed, I, I've stayed a little longer on that than I wanted to, but I thought it was important. Moving on from there, the fourth thing is using mockups. I don't think people use mockups enough. I don't think people really place enough investment or emphasis on it. I keep saying people, let me talk about myself. 
I don't think I did that in the past. And I've underestimated the power of utilizing mock-ups. Now, when you want to use these properly, I think you need to help people visualize what you created by displaying something in its proper context. You need to utilize mock-ups to highlight the worth of what you produced and show that it actually exists or can exist in the real world, right? So if you don't find the perfect picture, and I mentioned previously that and when you're doing visual storytelling, you might want to add your logo. Mockups exist of certain photo shoots where you can, you know, implement your logo on a t-shirt, on a on a hat or something of that nature. It doesn't necessarily matter. And it looks like it's a real thing. That also helps people look at your portfolio and, and trust it a bit more because they say to themselves, oh, wow, this just wasn't a concept. It actually was used in the real world. Now, some people can look through and say, oh, I know that's a mock-up. But regardless, at least it helps them visualize, oh, this is what it looks like on a t-shirt. Awesome. Now, getting back to Jordan, because Jordan is a writer of sorts, not necessarily a graphic designer, so I want to comment for her. Okay, what did you write? You wrote a case study? What was the end result? Was it in a report? Okay, let's get a mock-up or buy one if you have to. Let's get a mock-up of an annual report or let's get a mock-up of some type of report and put your text there and add a couple of visual photos from what we just learned in the last point. That'll help you visualize, oh, this writing actually was used in a real world report. Awesome, right? Who knows, maybe you buy, you write something for someone and it's somewhat of a case study. Okay, great, if, if that's what you do as a writer. How about we go purchase or download a case study PowerPoint or a keynote file that someone else created and you paste in what you wrote and you have that on your site as an example. That would work, right? People can visualize, oh, wow, this is awesome. She wrote a report and this is what it looks like in PowerPoint form. Awesome. Show the different real world applications really quick. Here are some places where you can go to get mock-ups. Some of these are um, some of these are free. Some of these uh, cost money. It just depends on where you're going. Uh, yeah, it really just depends. But some of these are free. Some of these cost money. Uh, yeah, it just it just depends. Um, I think the first link actually have a typo, so I'm going to fix it. So don't go there because it won't work. Go here. Okay, there you go. So that's where you need to go, the first link, if you wanna check that out. Uh, Graphic River, those aren't free, but those resources are low price, I like that. Graphic Burger, there's a lot of free things there. Creative Market, a lot of low cost, great mockups that I like, I use it. Um, this is what I mean by investing. Sometimes you might have to invest. That's a good thing. Uh, Smartmockup.com, and then Yellow Images, they tend to focus more on 3D mockups. But the good thing about that is uh, they have a, a wide range of things. So if you're into product design or like I said, if you make a logo or any type of branding, maybe it needs to be on a certain, maybe you have branding that goes on the wrap of a truck. They have that too, right? Or it goes on a box or a delivery box. They have that too. So it just depends. But these are just a few places to get mock-ups. I would recommend going there to utilize them really quick. Here is a graphic element I made for a campaign. Now this was just a graphic element I made. It wasn't the overall logo of the brand, but it was just something, it actually was the tagline of the brand and I just stylized it so that they can use it. And yeah, it ended up being used on hats, right? Uh, they use it on hats. I'm going to cycle through this. They utilize it on t-shirts. They utilized it um, and t-shirts and it looked like pretty good when it was actually on a printed shirt. It looked pretty good, right? Uh, I thought it was pretty amazing. I was like, oh, that t-shirt that actually is awesome. Like that, that photo shoot actually went well. You know, I didn't, I didn't think it would look that good, but I thought it was simple and it looks pretty good. Now, a quick thing is the only reason this became a hat is because this is a mock-up. I put this on a 
hat mock up or you know a fitted hat well actually it was yeah it was fitted and it was also a snapback hat i put this on a mock up which introduced the idea of oh we could we should get hats right that's something else that i could increase the branding on because i introduced the idea because they wouldn't have gotten it if they didn't know how it looked i didn't have to print something for them to finally see it right they saw it, this looks good let's order them these t-shirts i did the same thing i don't think they had an idea for a t-shirt they didn't know what they were going to do i put this on a t-shirt as an example huh this looks good this works and as we can see this actually did work for them it did work well now a quick thing let me ask do you think the photo that i have here is real or is it a mock-up i'm just curious if you're in the chat let me know if it's real or if it's a mock-up i'm just curious to know what your answer might be and um i'll wait a little bit just to see what everybody's going to type but i'm curious the image to the right is it real or is it a mock-up whether you're looking on the replay or you're live let me know what your thought is i'm curious to know uh what your thought is with that just let me know really quick like I said, I'll wait a little bit. And while I'm waiting, I'll pull up something else. But let's see what some of the comments are as we have waited. Let's see, I'm going to the chat. Yeah, no one's really weighed in yet, but um, I'll wait a little longer. I'm actually pulling up something um, as it relates to these t-shirts that I think you all will find interesting. But I'm curious to know, do you think it's real or if it's a mock-up? I'll wait a little longer and then we will continue to move on. Okay, cool. Glad you walk away in at least that much. Uh, that That's pretty cool. Well, ultimately, the image to the right, um, it is not a photo shoot. Um, in a sense, we did not have that photo shoot with the t-shirt. There actually was a mock-up I found, and then I added the, you know, stylized logo statement, truth is here to it. You know, did a little bit of Photoshop, and, you know, it looked pretty decent, right? But I definitely can say that t-shirts were produced, they were real, people posed, and uh, later on, people did wear those t-shirts for real. So I can actually show imagery from the actual client where that worked out or I can also just say well I'm only going to focus on coming up with mock-ups and going from there so either way um, it's a win-win uh, for that I wanted to show you uh, a live picture I'm actually looking for it everybody's wearing like all these other uh, <laughs> t-shirts I made not the ones I want to show you but either way that's okay so just really quick, where is this photo? Well, I'll just find one. So I'll duplicate this really quick. As I mentioned, I wasn't going to show this originally, but I'll show it here. Yeah, this is a picture of uh, in action. Two women, I think they're actually praying at that event. Uh, you know, cool. But regardless, that's a t-shirt right so that's the real you know either way that looks like the real t-shirt as well because there's a white one and there's a black one either way um if, if you can't get a shot like this which is difficult because i didn't take this picture the photographer of the event sent it to me later on so you might not able be able to get that but you, if you can utilize mock-ups smartly you can find an image like this and once again this kind of fit their target market too so it's more believable it was a young adult audience they were trying to reach and different things of that nature. So, again, this worked perfectly. It was a mock-up. We all don't have fo for, uh, high expensive cameras to take. We all can't always set up a photo shoot. So something like this helps you get around that and helps to make it be more believable. We're actually at the fifth and last thing. And uh, I'll be quick about it. But this is your about section. This is more of a mistake I see people make, a mistake that I've made when it comes to writing your about section. Um, we talked a little bit about this as it pertains to coming up with your, um, yeah, as it pertains to coming up with your 
description or your job title. We talked about this a little bit, but ultimately, um, yes, you would need to know how to write your about section. It doesn't matter if your about section is on your website, if you have a portfolio on Dribble or um, Behance or something of that nature, it doesn't matter where your portfolio is. Either way, um, you need to know what to write for your about section. So let's step through this. The first thing, and I'll move these out the way again. I just had these guys there. I should have got rid of them. Are they on every slide? They are. Let me just hide these then because they shouldn't be there. Um, yeah, let me just hide all of them. All right. So, again, who, who you are. So introduce yourself. My name is Nathan. You can talk about how much experience you want or if you have, if you will, but I can say something to the effect of, my name is Nathan. I am a web designer with 10 years of experience from Houston, Texas. Who, who are you? Now, if you wanna add a little personal item to that or a little something of intrigue about you, that's perfectly fine, but don't make it too long. So who are you? What do you do? I mentioned earlier, my name is Nathan. I am a web designer based in Houston, Texas. Uh, who I am, what I do, simple. I don't go on this long story of saying my background. I didn't say anything about me doing a, a engineering school. I didn't say anything about me being self-taught. I didn't say anything about that. I just said, this is who I am, this is what I do. Now, if you do multiple things, you know, maybe you're a writer and an editor and different things of that nature, okay. But for simplicity, put the more simple thing. Oftentimes, I tend to lead and say, I'm a web designer, because it's more simple to understand but a lot of times I still say digital marketing strategist so people can ask questions about that. But sometimes I, it depends on whom I'm talking to. I keep it very simple. Then you say how you can help, who you are, what you do, how you can help. Uh, I was going to repeat uh, my own description, but I'll wait because there's actually something I want to show you. And then lastly, the impact your results have. So that, in a sense, is something that I really don't see. I see a lot of the, the top three in some shape, form, or fashion when people write their about section, but they don't put the impact. And it doesn't have to be some long explanation of the last client I had had a 200% increase. You can say something more simplistic than that, something to the effect of, hi, my name is Nathan. I am a graphic designer with 10 years of experience based in Houston, Texas. Um, I enjoy helping, fill in the blank of who I like to help, right? I enjoy helping people. Oh, let me say something like this. I enjoy uh, creating branding for conferences and events. And I, I enjoy creating branding for conferences and events, which leads to them having an impact in increasing their signups each year. I can put a percentage to that. Increasing their signups by 30% each year. Okay, cool. That was quick. I see you have produced results. I see what you can do. I see you can help. Great. Uh, this is something that I put for the host of this live training. So who is this, you know, who's hosting this live training? Nathan Lote, web designer and digital marketing strategist, business of freelance. Nathan, actually, let me zoom in a little bit so you can read this uh, if you're, you know, watching this again. So I'll zoom in a bit. Uh, let me zoom out a little bit. I want to make sure you can read this. Okay, great. It said... Nathan is a digital marketing consultant, designer, podcaster, and author of Freelance Jumpstart. He hosts the Freelance Jumpstart podcast, an online resource that teaches designers the business side of freelance. I didn't need to add this second thing there. You got it, right? Who am I? I'm Nathan. I introduced myself. You see I'm a digital marketing consultant. I listed other things. Normally, I would only list one thing, but I listed other things because I wanted people to see what was available to them that I would have a podcast really, but I listed other things and said I was an author. But then I even said, uh, teaches designers the business side of freelance. That's what I do. That's what I do. And then I just put another statement to capture a little bit more. Nathan thrives at empowering designers and creative entrepreneurs to unlock their unique value by bridging the gap between creative skill and business expertise. So I learned things the hard way as a creative, but because I went to get an MBA in business school, I know that side too. 
this is not that long. This is literally what three sentences. That's it. Right. And you somewhat get it. If they want to learn more. You can go to my site or you can read more about me, so on and so forth. But if I just had this there, a lot of my portfolio would comment on what it is that I'm doing. So if this was actually the description for my portfolio, I need to put creative elements that highlight that. So I need to talk. I need to have my podcast in there somewhere and the things I created for my podcast. Right. I need to say uh, I created a um, freelance jumpstart. I need to talk about that online resource. I may need to show. A picture of myself teaching right if I say I'm a teacher I need to show that visually so again your description or your about page needs to also speak to the elements that are in your portfolio and don't be afraid to change it if you focus on I'll use myself as an example I've done a quite a bit of conferences and events if I want to continue to do that work in the future and I have that work in my portfolio okay let me put that in my about, you know, say conference and events or my specialty. If I don't want to do that type of work anymore, I need to adjust how my portfolio looks. I need to, you know, take some of those projects out of my portfolio. And when I update my about section, I don't need to put conferences and events because I don't want to do that type of work. Oftentimes I think, and I have observed, us as creatives, we tend to focus too much on the work that we've done in the past, not the work we want to do in the future. So go ahead and speak to that. So really quick, those are the five things, right? Let's actually walk through those again, just as a quick review. Um, those are the five things. Copy other agencies, you know, mimic them, study them, uh, imitate them. Uh, maybe it'll lead to you working with them specifically, or if you're vying for the same client base, they at least can see in confidence that you produce similar looking results in work. Show what your process is. Uh, again, you know, here's a quick Mario picture. Talk about this stage and how you got there. Visually, even if you have to, right? Don't talk so much about, look at this work I did, it's great. No. Talk about the before and after. That's a great way to summarize it. How was the company before they worked with you? How were they after they worked with you? And talk about the in-between of how you got there. Um, add visual storytelling. We walked through the images for a coffee shop, but really utilize this and lean on this. With all the free um, stock photography sites that are out there, in addition to the paid ones, I mean, there should be some element of photography in your portfolio, reg if, regardless of what you did. It should be in there. Uh, utilizing mock-ups. Doesn't matter if the mock-up is for a writer. Uh, doesn't matter if it's, you're a photographer. Maybe you want a mock-up of um, a photo reel on an iPad and you're putting that on your portfolio. That works too. It really doesn't matter, right? Uh, maybe you took a photo and it looks good for a marketing campaign. Maybe you put that photo on a billboard mock-up and just add a little bit of text so people can see, wow, okay, this person is a commercial photographer. Okay, I get it, I get it, right? Uh, or maybe you find a mock-up if you're a photographer of a photo book and put some of your photos there. They can see, oh, okay, maybe this person is a commercial photographer for editorial and different things of that nature. Oh, okay, magazine layout, oh, I get it. Utilize mock-ups, um, whether they're free or paid, don't be afraid to invest. And then lastly, your about section, and we just talked about that. So everyone, these are the five tips to transform your portfolio. These are five ways you can. Of course, there's a lot more I could say, but these are five things you can do today. Uh, you can do in a week and take one single project and just make it that much more better and for people to work with you. Just to end things here, if you're wondering and or thinking, uh, this is great, I like it, I learned a lot, this is honestly just the tip of the iceberg because I'm actually creating a resource called the Behance Blueprint. For those who don't know, Behance is one of the largest networks you can create and discover creative work. And they actually offer free portfolios to anybody who wants to sign up. So if you go to Behance.net, you can sign up for a free portfolio. No, this is not sponsored by them. No, I don't work for them, anything of that nature. But I just saw a lot of mistakes being made on Behance. And since it's 
the largest resource and has tons of designers and people vying for others' attention, I started seeing the same mistakes and said, you know what? Let me create a resource to help people improve their portfolio on this platform and get more exposure. Because I'll admit, as a freelancer who's working solo, it is hard to compete with an agency. But if you utilize this resource visually, there will be no difference between you and a top agency. No difference. Now you, in a sense, have a leg up. And even if you're not competing with an agency, you'll have a leg up over other designers with this resource. So if you go there now, uh, you will be able to see a free lesson where I walk through certain things and you'll have access to save money on that resource. What would that resource have? Um, a few things, and I'm adding more things over and over, but I'll lay out and describe uh, through videos. So there'll be videos, lessons where I'm diving in deeper topics. What I talked about with visual storytelling and photography, that's in there, but I go into more detail of how to do it. But that is in that actual, there's lessons that talk about that and I also have more resources of where you can get photos for free um, there's templates that are part of this so I have portfolio templates where you literally just drag and put in certain elements and you're done right so you find the photos that you want you have graphic elements you just drag them in a certain place and you're pretty much done and it has all the elements of what you need to have a better portfolio also um, with this resource I have studied and talked to certain people who work uh, for Adobe and I found out how they feature certain artists, right? And I have all the steps of how to get featured with that. And there's a community of different people who can talk with you, work with you, other designers who are willing to give you feedback and help you improve what it is that you're doing. So if you're interested in that, go to BehanceBlueprint.com. I think it is in the show notes right now. Um, I'll also paste it in the chat as well. Um, the biggest thing that I can say with that is I'm giving a huge launch discount for that. So I would definitely recommend, if nothing else, jumping on that list because this thing is going to blow up. I've already shown it to quite a few people and, um, yeah, they, uh, <laughs> they're like, this thing's going to be big. So, uh, I would say for now. Uh, jump on that list so you can save up to 40%. Uh, I can definitely say this. I probably won't make it cheaper as time goes on. But I'm not looking to make it very expensive because my goal is for designers to improve their portfolio and to get more work in the future. So that you won't, it won't be an arm and a leg in terms of pricing. Because I also understand that there's an international need here. Like there is people in the United States who can benefit from this. But there's people, as we see here, in uh, in Kenya who can benefit from this. There's people in uh, Slovenia who can benefit from this. So there's people all around the world. And I know based on currency exchange and different things of that nature, um, it might not be advantageous. Well, it would be for me, but it's not advantageous for you to pay a lot of money. Something that seems small in America might be expensive for you. So I want to make sure that, um, you know, no one is paying too much for it, but you definitely will get a return on your investment if you implement things the way I'm showing you uh, in this resource. So yeah, again, thank you. Definitely wanna make that comment. Thank you for taking the time to watch with me, sit here and watch through this whole thing. I greatly appreciate it. I'll pause for a moment because I wanna you know, answer any questions that you all may have. I'll check the chat to see if there's anything, um, but at this time, you're free to ask any questions that you'd like. Even if you're watching on the replay, I would say ask any questions that you have because um, I will, I'll go back through it and look and I'll try to give answers to that as well. So yeah, um, any questions you all wanna ask, feel free. I am here and I'm willing to give you any time or as much time as I need. I do see a question. Uh, from Jordan here. Jordan asked a question. Um, <laughs> she's busy with some other family things at the moment, but she's asking, uh, is Behance only for visual designers or would it work for all types of portfolios? 
I will admit that Behance tends to focus a bit more on those things that have visual elements. However, um, with what I've mentioned, it has uh, everybody like illustrators, people who you know uh, illustrate, whether it be cartoons, whether it be different brand assets for companies, whether it is hand-drawn illustration. I've seen all things. I've seen photographers. They have something called curated galleries. And when I mentioned the resource, I talked about how to get featured on these curated galleries. And they have uh, graphic design, photography, motion, architecture, product design, fashion, advertising, you know, arts and crafts, so on and so forth. They even have sound. So in your case, you'd probably fall under advertising because they describe advertising as the most engaging copywriting art direction and creative direction in print, interactive, broadcast media, and more. So the first thing they lead with is copywriting. Now the thing I'll say about it is, and since we're doing q and A, I'll, uh, I'll switch to a larger deal. Now, larger deal for the video. Now for copywriting, I believe it could work for you. Now I will admit, I think you would have to do a bit of stylizing of the copies that you've written or the headline that you've written so that it could be a little bit more visual so people can see that it was used in a campaign um, so it's free uh, Behance gets up to 50 million website visitors a month 50 million a month so that's similar of other designers and creators but that's also people looking to hire others that's also agencies looking for writers so if you're a writer, I definitely would say join the platform. Why not? I do believe you'd have to do some work in mocking up some of the things that you've written so people can visualize it in advertising, right? So that's definitely something that I would say there. So yeah, uh, I don't know if there's any other questions. Great question, Jordan. Definitely appreciate that. Uh, any other questions anybody has? I, I'll hang around a little longer, but... Um, yeah, I don't want to take up any more time. You know, we've been uh, watching for, we've been here for a while. So uh, I didn't know if anybody had any other questions. The replay is available. Um, and I will also send out a summary to say, hey, these are the things that we talked about. Um, let me see. Let me see these slides. I was going to send out the slides as well. But honestly, um, because of all the videos I posted here, I go deeper in all these topics anyway. So yeah, a lot of the things I talked about today, I go deeper in those videos, which have visuals as well. So I think that might cover that off. Yeah, honestly, again, thank you for taking the time to sit with me today. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, thank you for taking the time to ask questions, give me your attention, even if you're multitasking. Thank you. My goal is to help you become uh, you know, better designer overall, but more importantly, back to the initial quote that we said, get better at explaining your talent. Cause that's something that took a lot of time for me, but yeah, definitely appreciate it. Thank you. And I will catch you all later. Like I mentioned, you'll hear from me when, uh, this is completely, uh, completed and done and you'll see the replay as it's posted. Well, thank you. And uh, until the next one, I will catch you later. If you listen to the podcast, you'll hear from me sooner than that, right? So we'll be in touch with one another sooner than later. All right. T catch you later. Bye.